Hello YouTube. Uh, a short while ago in the uh, Q&A thing I did, I talked a little bit about uh, Newcomb's problem uh, and I've also had some discussion about it in the comments and I thought, well, why not do a video on it? Uh, I, I really love Newcomb's problem. It's a fun little problem. Uh, so let's um, set it up. We begin with two boxes, A and B. Box A is transparent and it contains £1,000. Box B is opaque and it contains either £1 million or nothing. And you're asked, do you want to take uh, only box B or both box A and box B? Well, that's not too difficult a problem, right? But there's a twist. There is a uh, being known as the predictor, which can predict people's behavior with near perfect accuracy. Uh, uh, and the predictor has decided the state of box B on the following basis. If it has predicted that you will take only box B, then it's put one million pounds in box B. If it's predicted that you will take both boxes, then it's put nothing in box B. So here's the table uh, showing the, uh, the, the payout based on the predicted choice and your actual choice. So the question in, in Newcomb's problem then is, what should you do? Uh, do you take just box B or do you take both boxes? Robert Nozick, who popularized this problem, he, he once famously said of it that, uh, and I quote, to almost everybody, it is perfectly clear and obvious what should be done. The difficulty is that these people seem to divide almost evenly on the problem, with large numbers thinking that the opposing half is just being silly. Uh, and that description certainly fits me. I'm a militant one boxer. I think that two boxing is obviously absurd. However, Many philosophers accept it. Uh, in fact, there's probably a slight consensus in favor of two boxing, uh, as far as I can tell. So I'm gonna try to present the arguments fairly, but bear in mind that I'm an extremely biased source. Um, also, I should note that this video uh, is just about Newcomb's problem. This problem has had a lot of influence on um, decision theory and, and related areas. In this video, we're just gonna focus specifically on this problem, you know, rather than on general uh, decision theory. Okay, so I guess, you know, let's begin by stating the basic case for each position. Why should you one box? Well, given that the predictor is near perfect, you should act on the assumption that the predictor's prediction will be correct. Uh, the decision you make will be a very good indicator of what the prediction was. So you should think if you one box, the predictor will have predicted this and you'll get the million. If you two box, it will have predicted this and you'll get only a thousand. No matter how clever the argument for two boxing is, if you are led to, to two boxing, you are almost certainly walking away with only a thousand pounds, whereas I'm walking away with a million pounds. So obviously you should take one box. On the other hand, why should you two box? Well, I think the main sort of intuition here is the content of B is fixed once you're presented with the problem, right? You, 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 so the, the predictor makes its prediction and it puts in the money and then you're given the problem. And your decision won't make any difference to what's in the boxes. If the, you know, if the million is in there, choosing two boxes won't make it disappear, right? And, and if, it, if it isn't in there, uh, choosing only one box won't make it appear. So uh, the crucial point for the two boxer is Two boxing always nets you more money, no matter what the prediction was. If one boxing was predicted, taking both boxes gives you more money. If two boxing was predicted, taking both boxes gives you more money because either way you get an additional 1,000 pounds. So, I mean, the more technical way to put it is that two boxing dominates one boxing. No matter what the predictor does, you're better off taking both boxes. So hopefully um, you should be able to see the basic intuitions that I, I guess drive the debate. Um, but uh, let's sort of look at some of the arguments in a, in a bit more detail. So we'll start off with the arguments for one boxing. First, uh, there's what is sometimes called the indifference argument. Uh, and Marion Ledwig uh, formalizes it like this. So premise one, many people have taken Newcomb's problem. Yeah, we can just imagine that this is the case. Imagine that it's been done many times in the past to many people. Premise two, um, you know, if uh, almost all of those who have uh, taken one box, won a million pounds, won a tiny fraction, won nothing, almost all of those 
who took two boxes, won a thousand pound, while a tiny fraction won the million and the thousand. Premise three, I have no reason to believe that I differ from these people with regard to predictability. In other words, there is nothing special about me that would justify the belief that I'm likely to beat the odds, as it were, if I were to take both boxes. Um, and, you know, I mean, with, with regard to this premise three, I mean, that's, that's just sort of built into the statement of the problem, right? We can just say that the predictor is, for you, near perfect. There's nothing special about you. Um, so you have you know, no reason to think that you're going to beat these odds. So you should one box. Two boxing is only the right decision, right? You know, two, two boxing will only get you the million and the thousand when the predictor is wrong. Um, otherwise you only get a thousand. But by stipulation, the predictor is almost always right. You should expect that the predictor will have predicted your actions correctly. There's nothing special about you. Um, so when you see the one boxers with their millions and the two boxers with their thousands, well, wouldn't you rather be in the former group? Um, so I guess uh, the, the sort of, I mean, I guess the main response to this is uh, the two boxer will accept the premises. Um, I think she has to, those are just sort of entailed by the setup of the problem. Uh, but just resist the inference to the conclusion. Yes, it's true that if you two box, then it's very, very, very likely you're only gonna get 1,000 pounds. But the point is that when you make that decision, there was nothing in box B anyway. Um, yeah, it's like you, you, you could only have got 1,000 pounds at best. So you're still kind of, you're still getting the most of what you could have got given what was in those boxes when you made the decision. Um, Okay, a second argument for one boxing is the betting argument. Suppose another person is watching you play Newcomb's problem. You make your decision, uh, but rather than open the boxes right away, the other person has to bet money on how much you will win. Uh, it's pretty obvious that if you've one boxed, they should bet that you'd win a min that you'd win the million, and if you've two boxed, they should bet on a thousand. And surely this, you know, this suggests that, well, if you want the million, you should one box. Uh, your decision, um, you know, I mean, before your decision, they wouldn't have known what to bet, right? It could have gone either way. But the decision is an extremely good indicator of what's in the boxes. Uh, we can push this a little bit further. Suppose we delay the opening of the boxes, right? And, and now you have to bet on what your winnings will be as well. Well, obviously, if you have one boxed, you should bet that you'll get the million. If you have two boxed, you should bet that you'll get the thousand. And furthermore, you know before you make your decision that when you have to bet on your decision, this is how you'll bet. So let's say you're, you haven't decided yet. Well, you can think to yourself, well, after I've made my decision, how, how will I bet? If I've one boxed, I'll bet that I'm gonna get the million. If I've two boxed, I'll bet that I'm gonna get only the thousand. So the key point is, it seems like, well, if you, if you want the million, you should probably one box. Uh, now, uh, Marion Ledwig suggests that this betting argument uh, really reduces to the indifference argument, because uh, again, in the betting argument, it seems like you're assuming that there's nothing special about you. If you know, uh, if, if you did know that you had some special property such that you might beat the predictor, you would bet differently. I mean, maybe you've seen thousands, thousands of these you can problem cases and you've noticed that the predictor tends to go wrong with people who have a certain personality or something like that. So, so again, this uh, argument, she says, really just reduces to the indifference argument. I'm not actually so sure though. Uh, I think the point about the betting argument is, you know, you, you're making a bet about, about what's in the boxes and the bet you make depends on your decision. So although your decision obviously doesn't alter what's in the boxes, it does quite justifiably alter your belief about what's in the boxes. Um, and so I guess, I guess that's the, 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 the kind of key, the key difference there uh, between this and the indifference argument. All right, the third argument for one boxing is what I'm calling the observer argument. Suppose that we're not dealing with a predictor, but with an observer whose observations are, let's say 99.9% .9 accurate. Again, you're presented with box A and box B, 1,000 in box A, and you must choose 
either both boxes or just box B. Now, if the observer thinks that she observes you choose, choose both boxes, she will leave uh, box B empty. If she thinks that she observes you choose just box B, she puts the million in box B. So what do you do? Well, it's pretty obvious, you choose box B. Um, now, the key point here is that the probabilities are exactly the same in this case as in the original Newcomb case. So the one boxer says you should make the same decision in both cases, you should, you should one box, uh, because you're, you're de dealing with the same probabilities. Uh, actually, I think the two boxer has a pretty plausible response to this kind of argument. In this observer problem, whether or not the million is placed in box B uh, is causally influenced by your choice of whether to one box or two box. So obviously then, you know, you, you should make the choice that will cause the million to be placed in the box. That's not the case for the original Newcomb problem. In the original Newcomb problem, uh, whether or not the money is in the box, in box B, is conditional on what your choice was predicted to be. Your choice now makes no difference whatsoever to the content of the boxes. Um, at least it, does, you know, it makes no kind of causal difference. It doesn't causally influence the content of the boxes. So the, the objection then is, well, in this modified problem, in this observer case, um, we, we've simply removed the features uh, of, of the Newcomb case that kind of give rise to the two boxing intuition. Um, in this modified problem, there is a causal connection between what you choose and whether there is money in the box. So it's really just begging the question to assume that this setup is analogous to the original Newcomb case. The whole point of the two boxer argument is that you can't just consider the uh, bare probabilities as it were. You also have to consider the causal connections. So obviously if you, you know, if you, if you change the scenario so that uh, your decision causes what's going in the boxes, then uh, the, the, the two boxing intuition evaporates. Um, okay, a final argument for one boxing is pretty simple. It's just that one boxing wins. The two boxers can feel very pleased with themselves for having made the rational decision according to whatever their pet decision theory is, but at the end of the day, they have less money. The one boxers win. If two boxing is the rational choice, why are almost all of us richer than almost all of you? Um, I'd say that's a pretty conclusive argument for one boxing. But uh, uh, so the two boxer, what would the two boxer say about this? Well, uh, of course it's true that one boxing wins in the sense that the vast majority of one boxers have more money. Uh, the two boxer will say this doesn't show that one boxing is actually the rational strategy. Um, David Lewis, for example, has pointed out that irrationality is sometimes rewarded. And that's, uh, you know, that's true. I mean, uh, it's irrational, for instance, to gamble at a casino because in the long run, uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty much guaranteed that you'll lose out. Uh, the house always wins. Um, but occasionally people will do it and will win big. Um, and, and you can find that with pretty much any other case of an irrational action, an irrational decision. There are cases where irrationality, uh, irrationality is rewarded. And so the two boxer says that the, the predictor in the Newcomb problem rewards irrationality. The very, well, the very way that the Newcomb problem is structured, uh, it punishes the rational and it rewards the irrational. Now, I think this response is, um, well, not, I, I'm not sure this is so, so persuasive. Uh, I mean, I'd say the key point about Newcomb's problem is one boxers don't just win sometimes, they win consistently and predictably. And I suppose it kind of raises a question of, well, you know, what is rationality? What do we, what do we mean when we say that some action is, is rational? What is it for one's decisions to be rational decisions? I mean, I would say that rationality isn't a matter of just sort of slavishly following some theory of reasoning, uh, regardless of how well it it actually serves you in terms of allowing you to achieve your goals. Um, I think that more, yeah, a, a kind of better view of rationality is that rationality is more a matter of 
predictably winning, predictably achieving your goals, you know, whatever those goals happen to be. In, in the case of Newcomb's problem, we want to make the most money. So you start by looking at, okay, who leaves with the most money? Uh, and then the rational decision is whatever decision is going to put you among those people who are leaving with the most money. I mean, I guess one way to think about this is to return to the, uh, the betting intuition, uh, the, the betting argument. Let's say you know, you're know you putting money on this stuff again. If I tell you that I'm going to a casino, I'm going to spend, say, a week playing at a casino, gambling my uh, savings at the casino, you should bet that actually I'll, I'll lose money. And that's why playing at a casino is irrational. Um, you know, I mean, assuming my goal is to make money, if I tell you I want to make more money, I'm going to go and gamble at a casino, well, it's irrational because I'm almost certainly going to lose money. It's um, predictably unsuccessful. But as we mentioned, if you're asked to bet about the outcome of Newcomb's problem, you will bet that the, you know, the one boxer will leave with the million and the two boxer won't. Yeah, yeah, and you'll almost certainly win that bet. The one boxer predictably uh, and consistently gets the million. In any case, I mean, let's grant, just for the sake of argument, that one boxing is, in fact, irrational. Well, that still leaves us with a question of uh, which box you would take. Uh, I mean, assuming you want the million, well, if you admit that the irrational decision is rewarded in this case, seems like you should probably be irrational and uh, take the one box. Now, of course, that's a bit of a you know, jokey argument uh, to say that you should one box uh, is uh, just to say that one boxing is the, the rational decision. Um, but my point is, you know, if, if, you in, if you insist that rationality consists in following some, some decision theory uh, and this decision theory entails that, you should, that, that the rational decision is two boxing, well, if you admit that uh, the irrationality is rewarded, why not be irrational? Why not one box? I mean, you, nobody wants to be irrational, but um, you know, you're going to get a million pounds, so I think it's worth it. Okay, uh, let's look at some arguments for two boxing. I think the primary argument uh, is what we might call the causal independence argument. So at some time, let's say T1, the predictor has made its prediction uh, on, on the basis of facts about me at that time, and it has already put the million in box B, or not, as the case may be, left it empty. Now, when I face the decision at time T2, the content of B is fixed and will remain the same no matter what my decision is. There's nothing I can do now to influence the predictor, to influence what's in the boxes. The future cannot change the past. And given what is in the boxes, Two boxing gets me an extra thousand pounds, so I should take both boxes. Maybe another way to, to look at this is, you know, the, the one boxer likes to say, well, look, if you take one box, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that you'll get the million. If you take two boxes, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that you'll get the thousand. But I think what the two boxer would say is, well, actually, that's, that's just false, right? Because if you take one box, well, you know, the, the money's either there or it isn't, right? So there's actually a 100% chance of getting either nothing, you know, or there's a 100% chance of getting the million. And when you two box, there's a 100% chance of getting a thousand, or there's a 100% chance of getting the million and a thousand. You know, once you're presented with the choice, the money is already in the boxes. So, you know, the, the kind of probability um, consideration just doesn't, doesn't work. I, mean, I guess this, in some ways, take, take, sort of takes us back to this claim uh, that we just saw that one boxing wins. Uh, as a one boxer, I like to taunt the two boxers. They had the chance to get a million pounds and they threw it away. But at the point that they make their decision, the boxers are set. If they had one boxed instead, they would have received nothing. Uh, as David Lewis puts it, we were never given any choice about whether to have a million. When we made our choices, there were no millions to be had. Furthermore, of course, although I have the million, and I feel very pleased about that, if I'd taken both boxes instead, I'd have had both the million and the thousand. The decision to two box wouldn't have made the money disappear. So one boxes are falling into a kind of wishful thinking. Uh, one boxing is indeed a strong indication that box B contains the million, but it has no causal influence. Um, and that's 
you know, if if you want x, but you know that an act y cannot possibly cause x to obtain, then it's irrational to do y trying to get x. That's just that's wishful thinking. So what might the uh, the one boxer say about this? Well, I think as uh, so, so as um, uh, Terry Horgan points out in his article uh, Counterfactuals and Newcomb's Problem, it seems like a lot of this rests on a disagreement about how to interpret certain counterfactual statements. The two boxer says, look, the boxes were set in the past and my decision can't change the past. And you know, that's obviously correct. So the two boxer endorses the following conditional. Uh, if I had one boxed, I would have received nothing. Right, so you know, we're imagining here that somebody has, has taken two boxes and they've received a thousand pounds. And of course we taunt them and say, well, you know, why did you take two boxes? Uh, you could have taken one box and had a million. But the two boxer says, well, no, the, you know, the boxes were set in the past. I couldn't have changed that. So if I had one boxed instead, I would have received nothing. And this conditional is true, right, given what was in the boxes at the time she made her decision. And so, so in that sense, she had no choice. She couldn't have received the million. The money wasn't available when she decided. But I think, uh, but what Horgan points out is, well, when we evaluate this counterfactual, if I had one box, I would have received nothing. We might hold constant different things. And what the one box cert will say is that when we evaluate that counterfactual, we can't just ignore the extremely strong correlation between the prediction and her decision. If you instead hold constant the accuracy of the predictor, then the counterfactual comes out false, right? So given that the prediction is near perfect, if I had one boxed, I would have received nothing, uh, is probably not true. It's, it's almost certainly the case, if you assume the prediction, if you sort of hold constant the fact that the predictor was correct, then if you had one boxed, the predictor would have predicted that and there would have been money in the box. So, I mean, you can sort of look at this in terms of possible worlds. That is sometimes a, a useful way of, of thinking about these kinds of counterfactual claims. So th there are four possible worlds in, in this case corresponding to the four possible outcomes of Newcomb's problem. So uh, in, in world one, take one box, receive a million. World two, take one box, receive nothing, and, and so on. Now, the thought is that when we're deciding how to act, we shouldn't be concerned with worlds that we are quite sure are not actual or will not become actual. Since we know that the predictor is near perfect, we can be virtually certain, right, that the, the actual world will be either world one or world four. It's gonna be either the world where we take one box and receive a million or take two boxes and receive a thousand. So we can dismiss world two and world three as being pretty much irrelevant for, for practical decision-making. And applying this to the two boxes counterfactual, you know, if I had one box and I would have received nothing, well, that comes out as false. On this, on this kind of analysis, the closest world uh, in which she won boxes is the world in which she receives the million. Uh, now, of course, this is not none of this is to say that one boxing somehow causes the million to appear in box B. We all agree that the decision has no causal power in this respect. But what matters is the the very strong correlation, the very accurate predictor. So, in terms of decision making, we should uh, ignore. Uh, world uh, world two and world three, and when evaluating the counterfactuals, we should treat these as much more distant possibilities. So the, you know, the closest world in which you one box is the world in which you receive the million, and so this is false. Right, uh, another argument for two boxing appeals to cases that have a similar structure to Newcomb's problem, uh, but where our intuition is more in line with the, the two boxer. So the two boxer uh, appeals to the, this, this principle that you should calculate the value of an action on the basis of how that action will causally influence the world. It's, it's about the causal consequences that your actions can have. Um, and there are, there are many simple cases that, that prompt a powerful intuition in favor of this principle, that it's causality that matters. Let's say we find um, 
a strong correlation between reading philosophy and lung cancer. And suppose we discover it's not that doing philosophy causes lung cancer. Instead, both the interest in philosophy and lung cancer are caused by some defective gene. There's a gene which gives people a tendency to be interested in philosophy, and it also causes lung cancer. Uh, but philosophy and lung, ca and, and lung cancer themselves are, are causally independent. They just have a common cause in this gene. So I think in this case, the intuition is, well, if you enjoy philosophy, right, there'd be no problem doing it. Uh, if you've got the gene, that's out of your hands. Doing philosophy is evidence that you will get the cancer, but it won't causally affect this. It's not in itself going to uh, going to harm you. It's not in itself going to going to give you cancer. It's it's just evidence that you have this gene, but that's completely out of your hands. Um, and I think that that's pretty plausible, right? I mean, I think we would say in this case that yeah, go ahead, do philosophy if you enjoy it. Now you can see that this has quite a similar structure to Newcomb's problem. So here it is, uh, you know, doing philosophy would be evidence that you have the cancer gene. Uh, kind of equates to two boxing would be evidence that box B is empty. But doing philosophy will not cause cancer. Uh, so if you enjoy philosophy, you might as well do it. That is uh, kind of equivalent to taking two boxes will not cause box B to be empty. So if you want the thousand in box A, you might as well take it. Uh, Robert Nozick has raised this challenge to one boxes to say, well, what exactly is the difference between Newcomb's case and these cases? In this philosophy case, it, it looks like it would just be completely irrational to uh, avoid doing philosophy, you know, just because it, it, it's, it's correlated with lung cancer. So in the same way, surely it should be irrational to avoid taking box A just because you know, it's, it's correlated with not having the million. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I agree that in the uh, philosophy and cancer example, you might as well do philosophy. I'm not sure we can really draw general conclusions from this though, because I think we can quite easily construct cases that, that push our intuitions in the other way. Um, so for example, suppose we have um, similarly a, a gene which causes people to choose to read philosophy and it causes cancer in almost all of these cases. Uh, so, uh, and also suppose that choosing to read philosophy is almost never caused by anything else. Uh, and, and, and choice is important here. It's not simply the desire to do philosophy, but the actual choice, choosing to do it. Um, so this, this gene causes uh, cancer in almost everybody who has it. So uh, again, the, the general situation is let's say 99% of people who choose to do philosophy, regardless of whether or not they have any desire to do philosophy, but just the people who choose to do philosophy, 99% of the people who choose to do philosophy have the cancer gene, and basically everybody with the gene ends up with the cancer. And let's say it's a very aggressive cancer. It hits you when you're you know, 30 and is completely untreatable. Obviously this scenario is biologically absurd, um, but you know, in this case, I would not do philosophy. In fact, given these facts, I think it would be completely insane to do philosophy. It would be just as crazy to do philosophy in this scenario uh, as it is to be a two boxer in Newcomb's case. Um, and I mean, my point is that this, uh, this kind of variation on the philosophy cancer gene scenario seems to me to be much more analogous to Newcomb's problem than the more realistic scenario given, given earlier. I mean, it is true that I think in the real world, most cases that we see are more like the standard gene case, right? We very rarely, if ever, face scenarios that are similar to Newcomb's problem in terms of the uh, extreme probabilities and the nature of the payoff. Uh, so perhaps we have good reason in practice for adopting this, this rule of thumb that you calculate value based on causal consequences. But you know, that doesn't mean that you have to be uh, sort of fundamentalist about it. I mean, if there are scenarios where that principle stops working, it stops you winning, do something else, adopt, adopt a different rule of thumb. Um, Newcomb's problem is a very unrealistic scenario. Most of the scenarios that are more realistic, it does seem right that you just consider the causal consequences. But I think actually when you 
when you look at you know scenarios like uh, this more extreme case of the philosophy and cancer gene, uh, it's not at all obvious that um, that you should always just act based on causal consequences. Okay, uh, another popular argument for two boxing. So imagine this twist on Newcomb's problem. Suppose that you have a good friend sitting opposite you. You can't see what's in box B, but he can. Um, now he can't he can't tell you what's in box B, but he can try to persuade you uh, either to one box or to two box. What would he What would he tell you? What would he try to persuade you to do? I mean, obviously, he'd tell you to two box. Um, if you were predicted to one box, then there's uh, a thousand in A and a million in B. So he would t he would tell you take both boxes. If you were predicted to two box, there's a thousand in A and nothing in B. So he'd tell you take both boxes. No matter what the circumstances, he would plead with you take both. And notice furthermore that in principle it, it makes no difference whether or not your friend is actually there. Um, I mean, as, as this thought experiment, experiment demonstrates, you can just imagine that he's there and you know what he would say. Um, you know that he would tell you to take both boxes no matter what. The crucial point is that you know when you face Newcomb's problem that a person who has more information than you would always tell you to take both. And so that seems like a pretty good reason to take both. What might the uh, one boxer say to this? Well, first of all, I mean, I, I, I would caution that this twist on the scenario is liable to be a bit misleading. When the problem is set up with a friend who can see the boxes, it's easy to imagine viewing it from the point of view of the friend um, and being able to see what's in the boxes. But obviously, if you can see what's in the boxes, it's, uh, well, it's a very different scenario. Um, it's, it's crucial to the very setup of Newcomb's problem that you're making a decision under the conditions of limited information. So you have to keep in mind that, yes, uh, even with your friend there, you do not know what is in those boxes. And I would say that's why you, you should consider the probabilities. Your friend, of course, will tell you to two box because two boxing is dominant. Um, but in your situation of limited information, you have to bear in mind that you can be almost certain. The million will only be there if you're the kind of person who is not going to be influenced by your friend's pleas. So you, you can be almost certain that if you decide to ignore your friend, you're going to get the million. Whereas if you let him sway you, you're getting a thousand. Um, I mean, it seems to me that the you know, presence of your friend doesn't really change anything. I mean, obviously he would tell you to take both boxes because he can see what's in them. And you know, if, you can, if you can see what's in the boxes, then there's just no question at all that you take both. Um, so uh, I, I'm not sure that this really adds anything more to the problem than what we kind of already know, uh, what's sort of originally there in the original setup. Um, okay, uh, so there's a very, uh, I think, general objection to almost all of the arguments that we've seen in favour of two boxing. And this objection um, begins by supposing that instead of a near perfect predictor, there is a perfect predictor. This predictor, let's say, is totally omniscient. It predicts human behavior with 100% accuracy. So in this case, there really are only two options available to you. One box and get the million, or two box and get the thousand. Uh, whatever, whatever you do is what has been predicted. Um, so in this situation, it's obvious that you one box, right? Um, I mean, of course, it's obvious that you should one box in the original Newcomb problem as well. But, you know, with the perfect predictor, it's even more obvious. I mean, there really, there really can be no question here that you one box and just take the million. So this example, I think, should be of some concern to the two boxer because the same arguments that she uses to defend two boxing in the standard Newcomb case are also applicable to this case. So. Uh, you know, the, the, the points that were raised about causal independence, you know, and, and causality and making decisions based on causal consequences, those points 
all apply to the perfect predictor case as well, right? So it's, it's true in the perfect predictor case that your decision can't affect what's in the boxes. Similarly, the uh, argument about the friend, well, that's also applicable in the perfect predictor case. In the perfect predictor case, your friend, if your friend was there and he could see in the boxes, he would still encourage you to two box. Um, but you know, you'd, you'd ignore him, right? Clearly, two boxing is wrong here. Um, and that would suggest that these arguments for two boxing in the standard Newcomb case are maybe not so good. I mean, actually, there, there's maybe a, a kind of general objection to two boxing here. Uh, when the predictor is 100% accurate, there's no question that you should one box. So why would it make such a difference when the predictor is merely you know, near perfect? Um, what's the, uh, why is that such a significant change? Um, so one, uh, I guess, response to, to this um, was actually suggested in the uh, comments to one of my previous videos by somebody called Hector Ramage. In the, in the perfect predictor case, your actions are determined and so there is no decision to be made. You have no free will. Basically, you have no ability to decide anything one way or the other. And so the question of what you should do can't sensibly be asked. When we say, well, you know, should you one box or two box, that implies that you have some sort of decision. Um, but if the predictor is 100% accurate, then you don't have the ability to decide anything. So I, I think that's kind of an interesting response. I don't find it persuasive. Uh, first of all, because I'm inclined to be a compatibilist about free will, I'd say that free will is compatible with determinism, so you could still have free will in the perfect predictor scenario. Um, but anyway, I, I think free will is not really important to, to Newcomb's problem. Uh, in fact, I think it's not important to much of anything. Uh, the key point for me is that even if the universe is determined, even if there is no free will, you do still have to make decisions in, in, in the sense of decision that matters. So a nice definition of decision, which I've got from Google, is a conclusion or resolution reached after consideration. Now, clearly, we do make decisions in this sense, and we can reflect on our decisions, and we can think about them, and think about, I don't know, decision theory, so as to make better decisions in the future. Um, the metaphysics of determinism, indeterminism, free will, all that stuff, is totally tangential to this. Clearly, we do make decisions in this sense. Um, what matters is that we have interests and we have to act on limited information. And so we often have to ask ourselves, well, what should I do now? Um, and that is, even in the perfect predictor case, that's a question that we would have to ask ourselves. We would deliberate and come to a conclusion. And the conclusion that we would all come to, I would imagine, in the perfect predictor case, is to one box. Uh, so I think that this um, at least uh, poses some problems for many of the arguments that we've seen for two boxing. Uh, one boxing is clearly the right answer in the perfect predictor case, but all of the arguments for, for two boxing that we've seen so far would also tell you to two box in, in the perfect predictor case. Uh, and that's that just can't be right. Um, okay, so not all arguments for two boxing fall prey to the perfect predictor objection. There is uh, an argument that, um, I guess we could call it the split strategy argument. So ask yourself, what is the best possible strategy? What is the best conceivable strategy for Newcomb's problem, right? I mean, what strategy would you have to use to ensure that you were going to get the million and the thousand? Well, it seems like the best strategy is to sincerely intend to one box before the prediction is made, but then to two box anyway when you're when you're actually asked to make your decision. So at T1, before the predictor has made its prediction, you should be a sincere one boxer. But then at T2, you should just two box anyway. Uh, it's best to take both boxes at T2, okay? Because you know if you sincerely intend to one box, then you're gonna have the million in box B, and at T2, you two box and take the million and the thousand. Obviously, this is not a practical option. Uh, if you were to try to have this as your strategy, then 
you're not actually sincerely intending to one box, right? So this is kind of self undermining uh, as, as a strategy. You can't in practice do this, or at least you can't you know, in, intend to do it. But the crucial point for us is when we say that this would be the optimal strategy if we could do it, doesn't this just concede that actually we should two box? After all, we're conceding that at T2, it's best to take both boxes. But isn't that what, what Newcomb's problem is all about, right? I mean, the question in Newcomb's problem is, what should you do now? Given that the boxes have been set and you uh, are faced with this decision, what should you do now, right, at T2? The question is not, what should you intend to do were you to face the problem again in the future or something like that, right? It's just, what should you do now? It's T2. You've got the boxes in front of you. And the best conceivable strategy tells us that at T2, you should two box. So I said that this, um, this argument doesn't fall prey to the perfect predictor object objection. And that's because this argument, um, as is kind of obvious, well, it, it, it kind of rests on this idea of using a split strategy so as to fool the predictor. You know, you intend to one box, so it predicts one box, but then you two box, so its prediction was wrong. So obviously this is not going to, um, to, to fall prey to any perfect predictor objection. Uh, necessarily, this re requires that the predictor is not perfect. Okay, so what might we say in response to this? Well, I'm actually not sure that this is the, uh, the optimum strategy. Um, I mean, it is surely possible to sincerely intend to one box and then to change your mind. Some people might actually do that. The problem is that whatever it is that leads you to two box when the time comes, the predictor will almost certainly have predicted this. Any last minute change of mind would have been predicted. So, I mean, this is, well, I guess this is sort of built into, I mean, it should be built in, I think, to the statement of Newcomb's problem, that the predictor is nearly perfectly accurate, regardless of what strategy you try to adopt. Um, and I mean, after all, the, the predictor, doesn't set the boxes on the basis of uh, what you intend to do before you face the problem. It's based on um, the prediction of what you will actually do when faced with the problem. It's not based, it's not, you know, the predictor doesn't ultimately really care about your intentions before you face the problem. What it's doing is just making a prediction about what you'll actually do when you face the problem. And this prediction is nearly always right. Now your intentions before you face the problem may inform the prediction, but obviously if the, you know, if the predictor is good enough and it is a nearly perfectly accurate predictor, then it's going to be able to predict that you would change your mind. So I, I think that the, the very idea of this uh, optimum split strategy kind of relies on the idea that there's some conceivable way, some algorithm that you could use to reliably beat the predictor. But there's just no reason to accept that. We can just, uh, you know, state in the, uh, you know, we can just sort of build it into the statement of Newcomb's problem that, that there is no such algorithm that could be used to beat the predictor. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I don't think that the two boxer can appeal to this notion of an optimum split strategy to defend two boxing. Um, so those were the arguments, uh, those, that's Newcomb's problem. Um, before I end, I, uh, do want to say one more thing though. In this video, we've contrasted one boxing with two boxing, but you might wonder, well, could there be other possibilities? I've sometimes seen people suggest online that when you're asked to make your decision, you could, for instance, flip a coin to decide. So you know, heads one box, tails two box, and that might allow you to beat the predictor in some sense. Obviously, uh, presumably the predictor isn't good enough to predict how the coin will land. So it's just random. Um, I should note actually that in most versions of Newcomb's problem, it's stipulated that if the predictor predicts that you'll play randomly like this, then box B contains nothing. So it's like you have to make a choice. Um, but certainly, you know, we can imagine a variation on, on Newcomb's problem where this isn't the case and where it would become possible to use coin flipping to, um, I guess, you know, subvert the predictor. Um, but I have to say, I don't really see the appeal of this kind of strategy. 
uh, I just sort of think, what, why would you bother? It seems to me like coin flipping is the worst of both worlds. Uh, so if you're, if you're flipping a coin, well, evidently you're not moved by the fact that two boxing dominates, right? So, so like the one boxer, you're not moved by the fact that whatever is in the boxers, taking both will give you more money. But then why not just one box? which gives you, you know, by far the best chance of getting the million. The one boxer has a very, very high probability of getting the million. If you flip a coin, it's 50-50 uh, at best. Um, so I just don't see the point of this kind of strategy, but maybe I'm missing something and somebody in the comments can defend it. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm a committed one boxer when you study philosophy, you'll, you'll often encounter views that are fairly absurd. Uh, eliminative materialism is often considered pretty ridiculous. I think that moral realism is quite ridiculous as well, though that's you know, pretty controversial. Um, I'd have to say, though, that by far, by far the most absurd position defended by actual professional philosophers is two-boxing in Newcomb's problem. It's just obviously crazy. Um, <laughs> there's an important principle that's drummed into your head as a philosophy student, which is that if you if you ever read an article or a book by a professional philosopher and you think that they're just being stupid, well, you've probably misunderstood them, right? It's more likely that you've misunderstood them than that they're making an obvious error. I try very hard to live by that principle, but you two boxers really make it difficult. Okay, thanks for watching.